Let us now come before the Word of God in prayer. O Lamb of God, who was slain, worthy is the Lamb. And we bow before you. We thank you for the great sacrifice that you have made for our sake. We thank you for the greatness of your salvation. As we come before your word, touch us with your spirit and grant us understanding according to your word that we may live and touch your servant by your spirit and enable me to be faithful to your word so that the name, name Jesus would be magnified. In his name we pray. Amen. Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Holy Week. Just before Palm Sunday, our Lord Jesus was in the little town of Bethany, just the two miles, just two miles from Jerusalem. And there he performed the greatest miracle in his earthly ministry. He raised Lazarus from the dead, who had been dead four days. And the news of the miracle spread quickly to the crowd who have gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now on Palm Sunday, when people see Jesus coming into Jerusalem, they hail him as their national hero. If he can raise the dead, he can surely defeat the Romans. They wave palm branches and spread them on the road. Palm branches symbolize, symbolizes Israel's national victory. By spreading palm branches, the people are hailing Jesus as their messianic king, who would bring victory over the Roman oppressors. Now, they are right about Jesus being the messianic king, but here is what they are missing. They have set their hopes on a political victory. They expect Jesus be a, to be a political leader who would drive out the Roman oppressors. They are thinking in terms of the kingdom of man, not the kingdom of God. But the Lord Jesus is a radically different king. So this palm branch symbolizes victory to be sure, but the victory that the Lord Jesus brings is a radically different kind of victory. Just as the prophet Zechariah prophesied, he enters Jerusalem bring, riding on a young donkey instead of a horse. By riding on such a lowly animal. The Lord Jesus is declaring that his kingdom is not the kingdom of this world. In the kingdom of God, the king is a servant. He is coming as a servant. He is coming to offer his life as a ransom for many. Then four days later on Thursday evening, the Lord Jesus eats the Passover meal with his disciples. Luke chapter 22 makes it clear that the Last Supper is the Passover meal. The Passover is a full meal, lasting up to several hours. But we Christians have reduced it down to a few minutes of communion on Sundays, 
and we have lost some of the richness of the Passover. So today, I would like to devote a little bit of time reflecting on the meaning of the Passover. I don't believe we can understand the meaning of the Passover until we are clear about what Exodus is for. Many people think of Exodus primarily as liberation from slavery, liberation from oppression. Of course, liberation from oppression is a crucial part of Exodus, and we don't want to take anything away from that. But just like <clears throat> everything good, the concept of liberation has become corrupt. In our society, the biblical notion of liberation has been deconstructed into something very unbiblical. To many people today, liberation is unbound freedom from all commitments and from whatever they consider to be hindrances to their individual lifestyle. To them, it's liberation from all tradition, authority, commitment, that limit their expressive individualism. Such a concept of liberation is a polar opposite of what we find in Exodus. Several times in Exodus, God says, let my people go so that they may worship me or serve me. The word translated worship in NIV has the basic meaning of serve. In Hebrew, every word is based on a root with three consonants. And from the root to serve come other related words such as servant, service, slave, and slavery. NIV translate, translates it as worship because it does have the sense of worship in this context, but it basically means to serve. In Egypt, the Israelites are forced to serve under Pharaoh. But when they are liberated from slavery, they are not moving out of service. They are being moved from one service to another service from serving Pharaoh to serving God. Liberation from slavery is just the initial part. True liberation must address not just liberation from, but liberation for. Liberation for the sake of something greater. True freedom is not just freedom from, but also freedom for. You see, we are always serving somebody or something. The whole question is, who are we serving? Who is our master? If we don't serve the living God, then we end up serving somebody else or something else. And that somebody else or something else is called an idol. Exodus is not only liberation from slavery, but also liberation for life with God. Liberation for the sake of life with God is the only true liberation. God does not rescue the Israelites from slavery, only to abandon them to live by themselves. That would be abandoning them to spiritual death. But God rescues them and brings them into himself. One of the words the Bible uses for this is redemption. God redeems them from death to life. And as we will unpack, the redemption of life requires blood. That's why it requires the blood of the Lamb in the Passover ceremony. 
Now, with that background, let us delve into Exodus chapter 12. God says to Moses and Aaron in Exodus 12, verse 2, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of you, your year. We learn from another chapter that the first month of the Jewish calendar is called Aviv, or Nisan as called later in Israel's history. It's based on the lunar cycle. So it changes every year relative to our modern calendar. Generally, the beginning of the Jewish year falls in March or April. And God commands that on the 10th of Aviv, the 10th day of the first month, each household is to take a lamb and keep it for the next four days. And this 10th day of Aviv, when they took the lamb, would have coincided with Palm Sunday. And God commands in verse 5 that the lamb must be year old male without defect. There is an emphasis throughout the Old Testament that an animal brought before God must be without defect. Apparently some people brought defective animals that were injured, limping, or blind. These animals could not survive very long and were not worth much. So they brought something they would have thrown away anyway that would be offensive to God. You see, God actually doesn't need our offerings. All the animals already belong to God. The whole world belongs to God. What God wants is our heart. So when we bring our offerings, are we giving to God the leftover stuff or the first fruit of our labor? Are we giving to God our leftover time or the best time of the day? The quality of our offerings reveals what is in our heart, and that's what God is looking for. Also, the lamb without defect points to something much greater. It foreshadows the lamb of God who is without defect, without sin. And in the fullness of time, he comes to offer the perfect sacrifice once for all. Then in verse 6, God instructs the Israelites to take care of the lamb for four days. And on the 14th day of the month, which is right in the middle of the lunar month, when they have the full moon, all the Israelites must slaughter the lamb at twilight immediately after the sunset. That would have been Thursday, four days after Palm Sunday. And they are to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel. Now there are layers of meaning here. First of all, why blood? We Christians often talk about blood, especially the blood of our Lord Jesus. But it is a strange notion to us in modern times. So there are two concepts that we need to understand from the perspective of the ancient Israelites. First, there is the deep-seated notion that the life of a creature is in the blood. To us in modern times, blood is obviously very important but we don't equate blood with life. But for the ancient people, life itself is in the blood. That's why God commanded Noah in Genesis 9 that he must not eat meat that still had blood in it. And this was codified in the book of Leviticus chapter 17. The Israelites must never eat the blood of any creature 
and the blood in the meat must be drained to the earth and covered with soil. They must treat blood as sacred because the life of a, cr a creature is in the blood. Second, there is another deep-seated notion that life can be redeemed only by another life. Life is sacred, and it takes another life to redeem it. Since life is in the blood, the redemption of life has to be by blood. That's why Leviticus 17, 11 says, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Then what is the meaning of the doorposts and lintels? Why not other spots in the house? Why on the doorposts and lintels? There is uh, actually a clue from archaeology. Archaeologists excavating at Tel El Amarna in Egypt have discovered the remains of doorposts and lintels with the names of the house owners written on them. So it might have been a common practice to put the owner's name on the doorposts and lintels. If that's the case, putting the blood of the lamb over the names of the owners on the doorposts and lintels would mean that God is declaring himself to be the rightful owner of the people in the house. So those who by faith put the blood of the lamb on their door, doorposts and lintels are now owned by God. And God himself will redeem those whom he owns. Now there are other layers of meaning in the Passover. Let me mention just a few more. God tells the Israelites to eat unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is baked without leaven or yeast. Why? Because the Israelites did not have the luxury of waiting for the dough to rise. On the very night of the Passover, God's redemption was upon them and they had to be ready to leave at any moment. So unleavened bread symbolizes the urgency of God's redemption. And that applies to us as well. If you are not following Jesus as his disciples in your daily life, do not postpone your decision to follow him as if you have another day at your disposal. You don't know whether you have another day or not. You really don't know. Do not postpone it until tomorrow because you might not have your tomorrow. God's redemption has come upon you. And now is the time of redemption. Another thing that God tells them to eat is bitter herbs. The bitter herbs are vegetables that, that have bitter flavors, such as horseradish. Now you might ask, why bitter herbs in this celebration of freedom? Because the Israelites must remember the bitterness of slavery their bitter suffering in Egypt. God knows how quickly they will forget and they will want to go back to Egypt when they face troubles in the wilderness. So the bitter herbs help them remember the bitterness of their lives in Egypt so that they might realize the greatness of God's salvation. For us today, bitter herbs symbolize our former lives without Christ. We were bitter to the very roots of our life, but how quickly we forget. 
how quickly we forget how bitter our life used to be without Christ. So we need to remember what our life used to be without Christ so that we may realize the greatness of what Christ has done for us. Then in Exodus 12, verse 13, God reveals what He will do on the night of the Passover. And God says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. I was listening to a discussion coming from the land of Israel about the meaning of the word Passover. It's the Hebrew word Pasach. And some of the Hebrew scholars in Israel have suggested that the Hebrew word for Passover might have another layer of meaning. Just, in, just as in most languages, the same Hebrew word can have more than one meaning. The Hebrew root Pasach can also mean to be lame in a dozen other verses in the Bible. For example, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 13, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. The word lame is from the same root, basaf. Another verse from Isaiah 35. Then will the lame leap like a deer, again from the same root, basaf. So in our mind, the lame conjures up a negative image. The lame are unable to walk around, unable to move. Obviously, this image cannot be applied to God. But think about a positive image that it conjures up. Someone who remains unmovable in one place. When applied to God, the word Pasach can mean to remain unmovable or to stand guard. So with that meaning in mind, let us read verse 13 again. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will stand guard over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Let's look at another verse in the same chapter, verse 23. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will stand guard over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. This verse seems to make more sense with stand guard. So for those who by faith put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lintels, the Lord himself will stand guard over that house. The Lord himself will stand firm over that house and will not permit the destroyer to enter so that the calamity will pass over. So that was the first Passover that the Israelites celebrated in Egypt. But hundreds of years before the first Passover, there was a foreshadowing of the greater Passover to come. In Genesis chapter 22, we have a story of the binding of Isaac. God commanded Abraham the unthinkable to sacrifice his son Isaac. And God repeated to Abraham who it was to be sacrificed, sacrificed four times. Your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. 
and as if to add to the agony. Twice it is repeated in the story. The two of them went on together. As the father and the son went on together, Isaac asked, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them went on together. God himself indeed provided the lamb. This story foreshadows another lamb that God himself provided. But this sacrifice is very different from that of Abraham. The night before the crucifixion, the Lord Jesus prayed to the Father in complete unity with the Father. Father, just as you are in me, I am in you. The Father is not sacrificing the Son without the Son knowing. It is the Father and the Son together with a complete unity of will. The Father sends the Son, and the Son, in complete unity with the Father, comes into the world. And the Son, the great I am that I am, offers himself as the Passover lamb. God himself becomes the Passover lamb. During the Passover meal, during the Passover meal, the Lord Jesus takes the unleavened bread and breaks it and gives it to the disciples. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when it comes to the time to drink the third cup, he takes the cup and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The disciples would have been astonished by it in traditional Jewish Passover Seder, they do not even mention the name Moses. If they mention Moses at all, they do so only once in passing in one of the prayers. Why? Because God is the only one who can be at the center of the Passover. And mentioning even Moses, the greatest of all prophets, would be a distraction. But the Lord Jesus puts himself at the center of the new Passover, the new Exodus, saying, this is my body. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. He puts himself at the center of the Passover. It's an outlandish claim. No human being has ever placed himself at the center of the Passover. If Jesus is merely a human being, then he's surely mad, insane, mentally ill. No sane person would place himself at the center of the Passover. But if Jesus is indeed who he claims to be, then he is the divine Son of God. He is the great I am that I am. And he is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and praise. Worthy is the Lamb. 
the Lord Jesus has given himself as the Passover lamb once for all. He has indeed won the victory. That's what we are celebrating on this Palm Sunday. He has won the victory, but it's a radically different kind of victory. And there's nothing we can add to what he has accomplished. There's nothing we can do to earn our status before him. It's all by his grace. It's all by his grace. But in the light of this costly grace, in the light of this greatness of his sacrifice, in the light of the shedding of his blood, can we live the same way? Can we remain the same as we were before? Each one of us must respond to this grace. So I would like to end with two sets of questions for you to reflect on during this Holy Week. So here's the first set of questions. What do you want to be freed from? In your heart, is there a bondage of sin you're struggling with in your heart? The bondage, any bondage to sin? Are you desperate for freedom from the bondage of sin? Examine your heart utterly honestly. Now, it's not enough to be freed from bondage. Remember that true freedom is not just freedom from, but also freedom for. So here's the second set of questions. What is your freedom for? You have been enjoying so much freedom compared to the Israelites, but what is your freedom for? What are you living for? What are you living for the rest of your life? So if you are struggling with any bondage to sin, or if you are wasting your freedom for nothing, then bring your request before God with utter honesty so that you can be truly free. And God is faithful to deliver you as he promised in Psalm 50. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. Hallelujah. Amen.